and welcome to the Crooked Path to Abolition, one of our public programs here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm Catherine Algor and I'm the president of the society. And I was thinking that um, probably this is, you might be one of the people who have dipped in and out of our public programs over the past eight months or so. And maybe you're kind of curious about the society itself. And I would encourage you to go to our website. Our website is masshist.org and poke around. Uh, we do a lot of things and we offer a lot of resources. Um, we have a blog. We, we have wonderful uh, selection of letters from an African-American family in the early 20th century. We have an object of the month, which in this case is very timely. It's a vaccination broadside from 1810. And we have all kinds of videos um, and uh, essays. And I think you'll find it worth your while. And of course, uh, there is a little button up there that says support. So if you would like to make a donation to the society, we would be very happy, but even better become a member. Um, if you become a member of the society, you get lots of cool stuff. And once we're back on Boylston Street, invitations of all kinds. So think about it, take a look at our website, but let's get started. Um, Gavin, would you get us started on tonight's program? Thank you very much, Catherine, and I'm happy to uh, welcome everyone to the program this evening. My name is Gavin Cleesbys, and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, if anyone is not familiar with the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, we were the first historical society in America, and we have been collecting, preserving, publishing, and sharing our nation's history since 1791. Uh, we hold an amazing collection of manuscripts, objects, art, and of course, uh, the pen that was used by Abraham Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, which was uh, what the picture was on the slide that opened the program. Uh, our collection is measured in the millions with the papers of US presidents, soldiers, mothers, pioneers, and everyone in between. We publish these collections, we make them available to researchers, and we host an active schedule of programs for the general public, educators, and academic audiences. Uh, we're making our collection and our online programming available for free, uh, but we're only able to do this thanks to the support of our members. So if you are not a member of MHS, I hope you'll consider uh, supporting our work. Um, this evening, we are joined by Professor James Oakes, uh, who is one of the leading historians of 19th century America. His early work focused on the South, examining slavery as an economic and social system that, uh, that shaped Southern life. His books include The Ruling Class, the Radical uh, and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and the Triumph of Anti-Slavery Politics, uh, and Freedom National, the Destruction of Slavery in the United States. Uh, the later two won the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize, an annual award uh, for the finest scholarly work in English on Abraham Lincoln or the American Civil War era. He holds an MA and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, um, and he has been on the faculty of the City University of New York Graduate Center since 1997 and the holder of the Graduate School Humanities Chair since 1998. He will be joined in conversation this evening by Professor Randall Kennedy, who is the Michael R. Klein Professor at Harvard Law School, where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race, race relations. He attended St. Albans School, Princeton University, Oxford University, and Yale Law School. He served as a law clerk for Judge uh, J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals and for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. He was awarded the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for his book, Race, Crime, and the Law. Some of his recent books include uh, For Discrimination, Race, Affirmative Action, and the Law, The Persistence of the Color Line, Radical Politics in the Obama Presidency, uh, and Sell Out the Politics of Racial Betrayal. They will be discussing uh, Professor Oak's new book, uh, the Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln and the Anti-Slavery Constitution, which explores how Lincoln and the Republican Party adhered to a clear anti-slavery strategy founded in the Constitution itself. So uh, without more from me, I hope uh, James Oakes and uh, Randall Kennedy will join us uh, and we look forward to a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for that uh, gracious introduction. And uh, I'd like to get the conversation started. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be in conversation with uh, James Oakes, whose work I've used in courses and in my own written work. And we're going to discuss his book, The Crooked Path to Abolition, Abraham Lincoln and the Anti-Slavery Constitution. And my opening question is, why another book on Lincoln? There are thousands and thousands of books on Lincoln. 
why did you feel that you needed to write this one? Well, I don't think, I actually didn't feel I needed to write this one. I never expected to write a, another book on Lincoln. Uh, it was, it's sort of, it's not a book I plan to write. It's, it came at the suggestion of, of my editor who read a couple of essays that I had written about Abraham Lincoln that were sort of fallout from my earlier work. Uh, but the suggestion came at a time when I was actually teaching some seminars on anti-slavery constitutionalism. And one of the things that's uh, uh, always disturbed me about some some Lincoln scholarship is the tendency to take him out of history and treat him as though he were some supernatural, you know, trans historical figure, you know, that uh, it, and it seemed to me that uh, the history of anti-slavery constitutionalism was, was a critical context in which you had to see him because Lincoln was, he, he had two characteristics that make him extremely useful for historians. Um, the first is that he could articulate the position, the anti-slavery positions of the Republican Party with extraordinary skill and, and effectiveness. He was a very good writer, you know, but he was also completely unoriginal. That is so that he didn't invent any of the ideas, the ideas if you've read other Republicans, other abolitionists, other anti-slavery folks, uh, uh, he wasn't saying anything that other people weren't saying. He was just saying them in, in, in a better way often. So he's useful in that sense for getting at a context in which he operated, which is anti-slavery constitutionalism that I don't think we have adequately appreciated. So I thought, let me, as I was figuring out what anti-slavery constitutionalism was all about, it seemed to me that's a good way of connecting Lincoln back to the context in which he operated politically, constitutionally, and, and the like. Okay. You, you say that Lincoln, quote, denied that the Constitution protected slavery as a right of property. Right. What do you mean by that? I mean, if, if slavery wasn't a right of property, a right to property, what was it? What, what do I mean by it or what did he mean by it? Well, well what did he mean by it? Okay, what did he mean? He meant by that that uh, the, the anti-slavery folks uh, uh, the anti-slavery constitutional tradition differentiated what they called a legal, a mere legal right, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is a right created by statutes or local governments or maybe even state constitutions. Uh, and they differentiated that from a fundamental constitutional right. And uh, the conflict, the the, the basic conflict over the Constitution uh, as it related to slavery was the pro-slavery position that the Constitution recognized and protected slavery as a constitutional right of property and the anti-slavery position articulated by Lincoln, which was that it was that it did no such thing, that the Constitution did not treat slavery as a fundamental right of property. Only It only recognized the existence of slavery in states that created it as a mere legal right. I'm not sure if constitutional scholars would recognize that as a meaningful distinction. And in fact, pro-slavery folks denied it was a meaningful distinction, but that was Lincoln's position that a constitutionally protected right of property is not the same thing as property created by local law or state law. Okay. You know, one of the things about your book is that it, it emerges at a moment in which historiographical debate is not just a debate in colleges, not just a debate in historical societies. Right. It's a debate that's being voiced by electoral politicians. Right. It's a debate that's you know, on the front pages of our newspapers. Right. Uh, where, as between, for instance, 
1619, and so a la, you know, the, the New York Times versus some of its detractors, which, you know, 1776, where does this book fit on that spectrum between the 1619 camp and the 1776 camp? Uh, it doesn't fit in either of those. <laughs> In okay. either of those camps. Um, uh, I think of the 1776 project as driven by a kind of patriotic nationalism. And I think of nationalism as always is an interpretation of history. And it's always a distorted interpretation of history. I think of 1619 as driven to some extent by a Black nationalist, or it's certainly a separatist interpretation of American history. And I think nationalism is always a distorted interpretation of history. And, and what's missing for me from not just those two versions of history, it's missing from a lot of mainstream versions of history is the conflicts. You know, there, was, there was just way too much conflict over these fundamental issues, whether you're saying America was born as a freedom loving nation, you know, and dedicated to freedom for all, you're missing the degree to which there were substantial numbers of Americans who were willing to fight for slavery and for all sorts of, of discriminations and, and inequalities. And if you say that America was born uh, a slave country, you know, and dedicated to slavery and that the American Revolution was founded to, was, was precipitated to protect slavery, you're missing the degree to which there was in fact an enormous conflict uh, at the heart of the American Revolution, at the heart of the Civil War, at the heart of American history over these very issues. So for me, it's, it's, it's a conflict question. And that's what I, tried to do in this book to show that it's not that I'm saying there wasn't a pro-slavery constitution, it's that uh, I, I wrote this to some extent as an anti-originalist book. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, a, I'm not a law professor and I'm not familiar enough with the intricacies and nuances of what originalism is, but it did seem to me that, that to, to posit an original pro-slavery constitution was not consistent with what I would see as the originally understood public meaning of the constitution for large numbers of Americans. And, and, and not just large numbers of Americans, but numbers of Americans who eventually took control of the federal government in 1861 and implemented that presumption that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document. So it's it's historically significant that significant numbers of Americans did not think of the Constitution as a pro-slavery document. Mm -hmm. Just as it is historically significant that significant numbers of Americans did believe that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'd have had no civil war. Mm -hmm. In your book, you mainly talk about uh, Lincoln and slavery and anti-slavery doctrine sensibilities. That's the main subject. Underneath that, you from time to time talk about Lincoln and race. And you call Lincoln a racial pessimist. Right. Tell us about that. I, well, I think that uh, one of the one of the things that historians have uncovered about the history of the colonization movement, which emerged, the American Colonization Society emerges in eighteen seventeen, and the uh, is that it reflected a shift away from an optimistic view of the future of emancipated African-Americans in the United States, that the first generation of abolitionists, the ones who precipitated the first wave of abolitionists in the North, looked to a time when African-Americans would be incorporated as full citizens, right? 
by 1817, the American Colonization Society comes along and posits a very different conception of the possibilities of a, a biracial democracy in the United States. And they were very pessimistic about the future, in part because of reaction against the egalitarianism of the American Revolution had set in. And we know what was happening to African Americans in the North as well as the South. Not only had slavery been dramatically revived in a way that hadn't been anticipated, but in the North, Northern states were taking votes away from Blacks who had previously had it, and they were entering into a period of intense racial discrimination, right? And, and, and people who were committed to a future of universal freedom without slavery, maybe, uh, began to think pessimistically about that prospect, right? Some were just racists who couldn't imagine the United States with free Blacks in it. And some were anti-slavery folks who might have liked that kind of thing, but imagine that as an ideal kind of future. But And Lincoln comes out of that tradition. Lincoln comes out of that kind of pessimistic tradition that doesn't imagine the possibility of whites ever allowing blacks to live as, as equals. In, the, in the, the, the best instance of this for me is this notorious meeting he had with uh, African-American leaders in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1862, when he's planning to issue an Emancipation Proclamation and he invites these guys to the White House and behaves very high-handedly in an unusually high-handed way and says, among other things, look, no matter where you go in this country, you're not treated as equals, go to the best place, go to Massachusetts, right? Or, or to New England, go to the, the, the place where you're treated best, you're still not treated as equals. And, and, and you should really think about, about going someplace else where you can be treated as equals, where you deserve to be treated as equals. So it's, it's not racism so much as racial pessimism about the prospect of blacks ever living as equals with whites in the United States. Yeah, the, the, the pessimistic tradition really interests me in a deep way, partly because my father was deeply pessimistic. I mean, the, the pessimistic tradition has, a, has, has deep, in, deep inroads, for instance, in, uh, or deep roots in black nationalism. I mean, yes. Marcus Garvey, right. pessimist, yes. Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, right. I mean, one could go on. But it, but it also has deep roots in, in white racial thought, I think of, uh, well, Thomas Jefferson. Deep, yes, he was deeply pessimistic. Or, or Alexis de Tocqueville, deeply pessimistic, obviously from a very different... From a different, from a different yeah, right. But Lincoln <laughs> was right there, too, with his pessimism. Although you mentioned, and you, and you mentioned so poignantly, that at the end of his life, Lincoln is starting to muse. In fact, the speech that he gives that prompts Booth to kill him. Right. Lincoln muses about, well, you know, maybe some black men can actually should be able to vote. And of course, vote. Right. You know. Right. right. Well, I I I just want to say that the, the kind of pessimism that you're talking about with Thomas Jefferson, I think, is very different from the kind of pessimism that Lincoln exhibited. Lincoln never, uh, Jefferson was grounding his pessimism in a kind of racialized conception of the, the incompatibility of black people and white people mm -hmm. as racial groups. And that's, that isn't where Lincoln was. Lincoln's pessimism was somewhere else. Uh, it's, it was coming from kind of observations of the political and social reality of the United States more than, more than, uh, than Jefferson's. Um, but yeah, I think I think it the movement of Lincoln on race is a really interesting and important part of his story. Uh, that is, you know, he said he always hated slavery. He couldn't remember a time when he 
didn't hate slavery. He grew up in an anti-slavery family. He was his parents attended an anti-slavery church. So we have no reason to believe he ever needed to be persuaded on the subject of slavery. But on the subject of race, it, it does seem to me that, that a, a compelling case can be made that he moved and, and, and I think really needed to move. And that, as I said in, in the book, I'm, I, can, I can speculate about this. I don't know if there's any way to prove it. The more committed he became in the 1850s to anti-slavery politics and anti-slavery constitutionalism, the more his deference to racial prejudice diminished. Mm -hmm. So that the movement isn't just at the end of his life. It starts, I think, in the 1850s when he starts having to articulate for the first time certain basic egalitarian positions that are embedded in anti-slavery constitutionalism, like all men are created equal in the sense that they are all equally entitled to the same natural rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's an egalitarian position, and it's an explicitly racially egalitarian position uh, it, to take in the 1850s. It's not equal citizenship. It's certainly not equal social and political rights. But as he pushes in that direction towards, uh, uh, towards anti-slavery politics, and that is, as he is radicalized by the Civil War the way many Northerners are radicalized by the Civil War, over the course of the Civil War, he does, it seems to me, move more and more and more in a direction of racial equality. Never gets to where we'd like him to have gotten, but certainly, uh, certainly the f it does matter that he's the first president ever to publicly endorse Black voting rights. Mm -hmm. so it is it is a big difference from anything that had come before. In your view, is there um, any place with respect to the slavery issue where Lincoln comes up short? That is to say, I, I mean, among among politicians of his era. Yeah. Right. Is there a politician who maybe comes, you know, comes out better? In oh, yeah. Oh, sure. So, Charles Sumner comes out better than everybody. Okay. Right. So uh, it's a, it, it's it seems to be built into the the way people talk about Lincoln, that that the comparison is always with the more radical end of the spectrum than the more conservative end of the spectrum. I think of, I think of America, if you put American pol politics on a spectrum in 1860, when the issue is slavery, you know, the, the right wing of the American political spectrum is the Southern Democrats, the Southern Democrats, the pro-slavery Democrats. And the center is probably the constitutional unionists of the upper South, the old Whigs, and the Northern Democrats. And the left wing, let's say the left third, is the Republican anti-slavery party. And Lincoln is smack dab in the middle of that. So he's on the leftward and what would we call them today, center left or something like that. And further, at the furthest end of the left are the radicals like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens mm -hmm. and, and others that we're familiar with. So he comes up short compared to them. Yes. Um, Although but, they never became president. I mean, they, they never, they, you know, right. so um, into, at least in terms be a of defense of Lincoln. I mean, he wanted to become I, president. Yes. And he could become president in part because he wasn't yes. on that far. And I mean, uh, he's uh, one of the things I'm trying to do in that book is to separate out his own personal feelings about certain issues, like abolition in Washington, DC, like uh, due process rights for fugitive slaves, and the position he wants the Republican Party to take in order for it to be a successful winning political coalition, right? So he's very clear in the late 1850s when they're trying to get the conservative Whigs to stay with them as a party, as a winning coalition, that he does not want the issue of fugitive slaves raised in, in the Republican Party platform. He does not want the issue of Washington, D.C. raised in the political. He thinks that the issue that is the common ground issue is going to be slavery in the territories. That will get us you know, 
Democrats who don't want blacks in the territories, conservative Whigs who don't want to hear about the fugitive slave law and stuff like that, and the anti-slavery base of the Republican Party to build that coalition. So uh, uh, I, I think that's, that's the difference between him and someone like Charles Sumner, who could not be elected president, or even, even William Seward, who had a reputation as being more radical. You know, but uh, again, one of the things I want to do in this book is is not to deny that Lincoln was different from the radicals, that he was not an abolitionist and never claimed to be an abolitionist, but that in emphasizing those differences, we miss the degree to which there is a broad base of thought among anti-slavery folks that radicals and mainstream politicians like Abraham Lincoln shared and that is historically very significant. Mm -hmm. That's very significant. Mm -hmm. One of the things about your book that uh, I found really instructive was the number of steps that Lincoln and the Republican Party took on the road to the 13th Amendment. So, I mean, you know, when people say slavery in Lincoln, they think usually of two things. They think of, uh, you know, me too. I think, of, I think of Emancipation Proclamation and I think of the 13th Amendment. Right. I don't typically think of all of the steps. And I must say, it, there came a point in your book where I just stopped counting. There were so many. I mean, there was just, you know, this after this after this. And I think people, could you go, could you walk through some of those of those steps, steps don't get much attention yeah sure i i think i uh, uh, this was the this was the essay i wrote the last chapter was the essay i wrote that caused my editor to say you need to turn this into a oh. book and it, and I, and I, and that's what pushed me all the way back to steps going back to 1789 but but let's start with the emancipation proclamation it's halfway through the war it's january 1st 1863 the war has two more years to go nobody knows that and, you know, uh, many historians t t think of the emancipation as the death knell of slavery. It just took two more years for the war to end. And for that. But one of the things I'm trying to, and it was in some ways the death knell of slavery. I don't want to deny that. You know, it's, it was a necessary but not sufficient step. And one of the things that became, that I find so interesting is the way Lincoln begins to use large-scale military emancipation, in especially the recruitment of Blacks into the Union Army uh, from the slave states to undermine slavery in the slave states enough to get those slave states to, uh, under pressure, abolish slavery on their own. That it was necessary for them to do that. That, that you need to know that this was the anti-slavery project from the beginning. This is how everyone from the 1780s on understood how slavery was going to be abolished, state by state by state. And the anti-slavery project was to use the federal government to the furthest extent of its constitutional power to nudge the states to get them to abolish slavery on their own. And the war accelerates that process dramatically. And the Emancipation Proclamation gives Lincoln a kind of lever, a club that he can use to undermine slavery in states like, well, Maryland, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, to, to get those states and pressure those states to abolish slavery on their own. And the reason that's important, and it's, it's just a simple question of mathematics, of arithmetic, really, you need, you need three quarters of the states to ratify a constitutional amendment. You know, we can, we can you know, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's movie on Lincoln treats the Congress's passage, the, you know, the passage in the House of Representatives, the final vote to get the constitutional amendment through the House, that's the end. But that could only be the end if there were enough states that had abolished slavery and were willing to pass that amendment. And that took several years of work. It was, it was the culmination of a much longer, much older anti-slavery project grounded in the constitutional premise that the federal government 
did not have the power to abolish slavery in a state. And it, it, so the irony, the great irony is that in order to get slavery abolished uh, nationwide, to get a nationwide abolition amendment through and ratified, you had to get the states. You had to get enough states to abolish slavery that they were willing to uh, ratify. Which mm -hmm. is, it's just, so, so you go from the Emancipation Proclamation to you open the Union Army to black troops, you start putting pressure on individual states to get slavery abolished, and they start to do that in 1864. And between eight, January 1864 and January 1865, six states or proto-states, if you will, uh, ab abolish slavery. And that really does shift the balance of power between slave and free states. It's inconceivable in 1860 that a constitutional amendment would have been passed. There were 18 free states and 15 slave states. Right? Even adding three new free states to the Union during the war uh, would have only made it 21 to 15. You had to flip enough slave states over to the free state column to get a constitutional amendment ratified. So that, that's, that process, I don't think, has been sufficiently mm -hmm. appreciated in the scholarship. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, for me, uh, if we're going to talk about Lincoln's central role, I would, I would put it there at least as much as in the Emancipation Proclamation. Because the Emancipation Proclamation always, it's, it is important, but it strikes me as something called for by the second confiscation an act that everybody's waiting for. And had he not issued that statement in September of 1862, indicating that he was going to issue a proclamation, he might have been impeached by the time Congress came back in December, because they were waiting for it. Everybody was waiting for this proclamation, you know, because Congress had authorized it in the Second Confiscation Act. Well, see, you mentioned, you know, the confiscation acts. I think that a lot of there were there were a number of confiscation acts, or Lincoln telling the the Union Army, "Don't enforce the fugitive slave law anymore," right. or Lincoln. One thing that I, Lincoln's uh, efforts to try to get the border states to get rid of slavery, and he said, "Listen, we'll pay you off." We'll pay we'll you all. Compensate you like they did in Washington D.C. A so little I mean, different from the way they did in Washington D.C., but yes, yes. But, but I mean, the, the, the point was my, it was just there were yes. lots. Yes. I think I was surprised to see in one place, sort of brought together in one place, all of these various steps. Some, you know, they they're they're lost sight of. They're put, sort of yeah. put in the shade. Of the Thirteenth Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation. I agree. They're I agree. To it. This momentum is building. Yes, I agree. Uh, yes, if 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 I'm pushing for anything in the last ten things I've written, it's emancipation was a complicated process. It had a lot of different agents. Saying that Lincoln freed all the slaves with the stroke of his pen makes no more sense to me than saying that the slaves freed themselves. You know, they're all essential, indispensable agents in a long and complicated process that had a lot of different steps. Crooked path, right? It's, it's, it's not a simple, direct step from Fort Sumter to the 13th Amendment. It's, it's not inevitable. It's not, you know, it's not foreordained by any step. In fact, I started uh, the, my big book on emancipation, Freedom National, I started uh, because of a previous book I had written about Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, Lincoln calls one of the highlights of the book, the high major events in that book was Lincoln calling Frederick Douglass to the White House in August of 1864, when he thinks he's going to lose his reelection and says, says, look, if I lose, there are not enough slaves coming to Union lines, and we need to get as many slaves emancipated before I lose this election or we're in deep trouble. And Douglas agrees with him. And I was thinking to myself when I contemplated that meeting, these two brilliant guys, both of them, 
completely committed at that point to the abolition of slavery and absolutely certain that it wasn't over. That if, if George McClellan and the Democrats won that election, which in August they were sure he would, that then the Civil War would have ended without abolition, without mm. slavery having been abolished. It wasn't over until it was over. It just, you know, it's, there was nothing inevitable about this. You know? So getting those steps, getting that to understand how complicated and difficult that process was, has been something I've been trying to get at for a very long time, that it goes back very far and that it took a long time. I want to digress for a moment. Sure and ask about the relationship between Lincoln and Douglas. Okay. I mean, two absolutely extraordinary people. Right. What was their, how did they feel toward one another? Well, it changed over time. It's, it's, not, it's not entirely easy to tell because these two guys were both pretty shut-mouthed about their own private feelings about things. They, they were public. We know them from their public speeches, you know, uh, uh, but it looks to me, and I said this in my book, that that in the over the course of the three meetings they had, they grew in friendship and even affection towards one another. So that uh, uh, Douglas first initiates their first meeting in, in the in the summer of 1862 as a kind of protest he's going to complain you haven't done enough the the, the it, it's a 63 it's it's um you you know the the confederates are killing black soldiers you need to issue a uh, 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 an order of retaliation and things like that. And he's got some complaints about Lincoln going too slow on black soldiers and things like that. And, and he comes away impressed, not persuaded, but impressed. The second meeting when Lincoln calls Douglas back to the White House and asks him for his help in getting slavery abolished, Douglas is even more, he goes away saying, oh boy, this guy is really more committed than I had realized. Uh, and he probably was more committed than Lincoln had been to uh, to the complete eradication of slavery. And then the third time, Douglas goes to see Lincoln give that amazing second inaugural address, and 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 Lincoln, you know, the, the, Lincoln calls him back into the reception and, and it greets him publicly as my friend Douglas Sight, you know. And, and, and it looks to me like they grew in admiration and and friendship towards one another over the course of the war. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about craft. Okay. You've written you've written you know a whole bevy of books. A bevy in of this books. book, you you mention in your acknowledgments, you you say you talk about the difference between the way legal scholars and historians might approach the same subject. Um, what is, what, what did you have in mind there? What is that difference? Well, I, I, at the time, I mean, it, I just published the book and I'm saying at the time I wrote it, but, but it's, I guess I was thinking that uh, there is the kind of commitment to the text of the Constitution and reading reading uh, everything you need to know about the Constitution from the text itself as a kind of lawyerly way of dealing with constitutional issues that I think of in political terms as, as issues that are contested, as issues that are fought over, that the text is not self-explanatory, that that uh, that that, as a historian, I'm interested in the conflicts that drive history, and it seemed to me that that just looking at the text and reading what the text said wasn't enough. But I'm uh, I, I I should have been a little more careful because the best legal scholars know know that, and the best historians, you know, there are historians historians know that you need to read texts in context and that's not incompatible with the way an, an argument for 
original public meaning uh, is framed, right? When Quentin Skinner and, and told intellectual historians, historians, you know, decades ago that you need to read Machiavelli in the context of the 20 other people who were writing about princely power in the Renaissance, uh, in Renaissance Italy, that's the way you understand it. It's kind of original public meaning, right? It's not rather than the great tradition, right? Machiavelli compared to somebody before him and compared to the people who wrote after him and stuff like that. So understanding texts in context is not all that different from saying what is the original public meaning, right? You're going to do the same thing. And so it's maybe it's not so different. Mm -hmm. as as I was suggesting, you know, in the book. And, I'm, I'm, I, you know, it was a response to some conversations I was having with some other law professors, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, I don't know what I wanted to do. But you know, I, I have to say, uh, uh, I, there was a historian, there was a legal historian was on my dissertation committee who wrote, uh, his name was Jim Kettner, and he wrote a really mm -hmm. important book on the history of citizenship. Yeah. And he he had me reading this great book by a guy named Jacobus Tenbrook on the anti-slavery origins of the Civil War and a book by Bill Wysick on the... So uh, this anti-slavery constitutionalism stuff is like deeply embedded in the back of my brain that I ended up coming back to it decades later is not entirely surprising. It's like a recessive gene showing up in your progeny or something like that. <laughs> So I have that kind of, if you think of him as a legal historian, even though he was, he came out of a history program, you know, uh, that, that kind of stuff is what legal scholars do. I suppose. The best legal scholars and the best historians are essentially doing the same thing, I suppose. I think, I mean, I, I, I mentioned before to you that, I mean, I think of, uh, analytic historians being very lawyerly uh, uh, among those who come to mind. I'd say yourself. I'd say David Potter. I mean, David Potter's uh, book on this on the secession crisis. Very careful. He has a point that he wants to make. Right. He he doesn't. He doesn't evade counter evidence. He puts it all out on the table, but he's, yes. he's making an argument. Right. But he's he's making an argument. Yes. And uh, I'd say Eric Foner is very similar in that regard. Yes. And you know, I think among 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 law professors, the, the, they're they're people who do the same sort of thing. So I was just suggesting. I mean. I don't think that actually there's a, a category of legal scholarship over here and the historians over here. I think there's a subject and right. people right. from various disciplines can grapple with this subject. And if they're doing a good job, they're doing a good job. Okay. I concede the point. <laughs> I readily concede the point. Listen, we've got a wonderful audience, and I think that they probably have some questions for you. Sure. I'll cede the floor. Let's hear okay. some of those questions from the audience. Well, thank you guys for a, a wonderful conversation. We do actually have a good number of questions, and I would just uh, let audience members know that we are happy to take more questions. Uh, we ask you to use the Q&A function, and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, so to start us off, um, Alan uh, wrote a question and he said, uh, would appreciate thoughts of the panelists on Lincoln's position on the 1861 pro proposed Corwin Amendment ostensibly to dissuade Southern states from secession? Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Corwin Amendment was proposed by a Northern Republican during the secession crisis. This, it, it basically states that Congress shall have no power to uh, abolish slavery in a state. And one of the points I've been trying to make in this book and in previous books is that th this restated the obvious. It was not a meaningful uh, uh, 
alternative to the situation that existed. In fact, if you read the text of the Corwin Amendment, it says the Constitution cannot be changed so as to allow Congress to abolish slavery in a state. So it's even within the, the text of the Corwin Amendment itself, it was acknowledging that, that it, was, it was asserting a position that everybody already pretty much accepted that the Constitution didn't allow Congress to abolish slavery in state. And one of the uh, one of the most telling points uh, about the significance of that doctrine is that uh, even if it had passed, it, nothing would have changed. That Congress at no point in the Civil War abolished slavery in a state. It just didn't. That's not how slavery was abolished. It was uh, state by state by state, enough states abolished slavery to pass the Constitution Amendment that effectively bypassed this federal consensus and said, there's no slavery anywhere in the nation. You abolish slavery nationwide. And, it's, and so, so uh, you know, I think too much has been made of the Corwin Amendment when, you know, when uh, uh, it, because it didn't really alter anything. And in fact, Southerners recognized it as, as a meaningless, you know, pseudo, pseudo concession because it didn't change anything. It didn't offer them anything. It was not a concession of, of any particular principle that anybody had, had accepted. All right, uh, Bill uh, ask, uh, and this is something that I, you certainly touched on previously, but uh, perhaps a little bit more detail. Um, he said, uh, to what extent did Lincoln believe that slave owners uh, had to be compensated for slaves uh, that were freed? Uh, who would pay uh, that compensation? I started to get at this in the question Randy asked me earlier. Um, Lincoln believed in compensation of the states that abolished slavery, and at at you know maybe at the, uh, at the rate of maybe three hundred dollars per slave, he would compensate the state. But the state, you know, I don't think he believed that the the government should be giving slaveholders money. It would be for their slaves. So a, a state could take the compensation funds and then say, we're going to build a railroad with this money, or we're going to build schools with this money. So it wasn't specifically framed, I think, mostly for, I mean, I suppose he expected it to go to the slaveholders, but but he wasn't willing to say that. But uh, he, he holds out compensation as one of the incentives to get states to abolish slavery. And he's, he's still advocating compensation in early 1865, when he's not sure they've got enough states to uh, to get the, the constitutional amendment ratified, he's still suggesting significant amounts of compensation uh, to the states to get them to do that. It's basically a bribe to the states to get them to abolish slavery. With respect to these, the District of Columbia, however, didn't the right. legislation Yes. that provided for um, the end of slavery in the District of Columbia actually yes. direct the money going to the slaveholders? To loyal slaveholders. That's the yes, only the place. Loyal slaveholders. That's the, that's the only place you see compensation. And that's congressionally directed. And uh, uh, it's hard to say why they did that, but I think the reason why, and it was sort of like... <laughs> you know, sticking it to their predecessors. Like, like, you shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have allowed slavery here. We're responsible for having slavery. You know, we as a Congress are responsible for allowing slavery into the District of Columbia. So we're going to pay you by, you know, to, to take your slaves away from you. But, but Congress was not responsible for slavery in Mississippi or Delaware or whatever and things like that. So, so it, it wasn't a precedent in any way. It didn't it didn't, you know, by the time Congress passes that, you know, the major mechanism of emancipation of emancipation during the Civil War is military emancipation, and that's not compensated. You don't compensate a disloyal slaveholder from a disloyal state who's engaged in disloyal behavior for their uh, uh, for their slaves once you've emancipated them or declared them to be emancipated. It was only loyal slaveholders in a loyal part of the union that Congress had control over, that where you see compensation. It was just 1,900, something like that, slaveholders who got money out of the 400,000 slaveholders. 
in the United States. So compensation is not is not a is not a major part of the story of emancipation. I don't think it, it's it tells you something about the politics of getting states to abolish slavery. It's one of the like like uh, colonization. It's it's an incentive you hold out to the states, you know, to well, to get them to abolish slavery. Speaking of predecessors, uh, Paul wrote. Um, what role did John Quincy Adams have in the development of Lincoln's anti-slavery constitutionalism? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very important question. So uh, it was John Quincy Adams who, he, he actually plays a peculiar role in the history of, of anti-slavery constitutionalism because he's, as far as I can tell, he's the only American statesman who ever argued that it was, it was illegal for uh, for belligerents in wartime to abolish or emancipate enemy slaves. He says this in the negotiations over the, over the ending of the War of 1812 at, when he was Secretary of State. Uh, he's the, uh, that, was in, that was inconsistent with the history that the United States already had of, uh, of uh, wartime emancipations going from the American Revolution, it signed treaties, Treaty of Paris in 1783, the Jay Treaty in the 1790s, uh, both, and, uh, both acknowledged that it was legitimate for belligerents to emancipate enemy slaves during wartime. Uh, it was John Quincy Adams who in the 1830s, when he returned to Congress as a representative from Massachusetts, who theorized that the Constitution did have this loophole in it, that, that the Constitution does not allow the federal government in peacetime to interfere with slavery in the state. But if there's a war, if there's a war, it is perfectly legitimate under the laws of war, under the war powers clause of the constitution for the federal government to offer emancipation to uh, uh, slaves in order to repel an invasion or suppress an insurrection. And that doctrine migrates from his mouth into the mainstream of anti-slavery politics. And Lincoln is saying that. And this, this is one of the things, you know, this is one of the things uh, I, I'm trying to say in the book is that there was this doctrine that I call the forfeiture of rights doctrine, right? That, that states that if you secede from the union, if you go into rebellion, any constitutional rights the, the, that you have as a slaveholder are forfeited by your disloyalty, right? And, and that's a logical outcome of the John Quincy Adams doctrine that once you're in a state of war, you, we, can, we can emancipate slaves that we wouldn't be able to emancipate during, during peacetime, right? And Lincoln gives a speech in 1859 in which he says, you know, you leave the union. If you're going to leave the union because a Republican is elected president, we are under no more, no longer under any obligation to return your fugitive slaves. And he repeats that in his inaugural address, and he begins to adopt that. And it's 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 mainstream anti-slavery thought by the 1850s. And it was John Quincy Adams who I think was one of the earliest theorizers of what could be done in wartime that couldn't be done in peacetime to slavery. Great. That's a bit uh, of a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. you know, Adams is, is popular in Massachusetts. We're always happy to hear more about him. Greatest uh, ex-president we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> he was more popular as an ex-president than he was as a president. But, um, so, uh, once said that. Uh, Peter wrote, uh, Professor Oakes, I was struck by your statement in The Crooked Path that, uh, quote, after December uh, 1862, Lincoln never mentioned colonialization again, end quote. This is such an arresting comment that I wonder if you could expand upon it. Uh, it's, it's fairly uncontroversial, I thought, that the last public statement he makes about colonization comes in his December 1862 uh, uh, annual address to Congress. It's a very interesting statement. 
because it's mostly framed as an attack on racist justifications for colonization uh, and an indication that, you know, he says, you know, they're here. We're not bringing people here who would not otherwise be here. If we don't colonize them, we haven't done anything to bring black people here so it, it's but it's his last statement in favor of colonization he never says it again there are some indications that privately he may have asked his attorney general to think about you know to what what could we do this in belize and things like that for for example and i doubt if he ever i doubt if he ever gave up on the idea that 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 might be the best solution or, or a good solution to the fact that blacks won't be treated as equals anywhere in the United States. But the last public statement he makes in favor of it is in December of 1862, just before the Emancipation Proclamation. And, and, and this gets back to a point we were discussing earlier. Uh, once he has the Emancipation Proclamation uh, as a club, he no longer needs uh, colonization as an incentive. Right. Emancipation of large numbers of slaves is a much more effective way to get states to abolish slavery, especially if you put them in the Union Army, um, than uh, offering colonization, which he never really thought, he always suspected was impractical anyway. Right. Um, so uh, Lewis uh, wrote, um, and this is kind of a good connection, which uh, said, uh, sort of follow up to the compensation question, but focusing not on uh, slavers, but on the enslaved. Um, aside from colonization, what did Lincoln think uh, or attempt regarding compensating or otherwise supporting the newly emancipated? That requires uh, thinking about his, how he thought about reconstruction. And we, we only have tea leaves there. Uh, and I don't think he thought enough about that issue before he died to think in terms. I mean, he, you know, he's a he's a Republican, so he's a supporter of the Homestead Act, and he might have been a bit more aggressive in in, in using the Homestead Act. But but I don't think he was thinking very deeply about compensation. I don't think compensation was in general on the minds of most Republicans. There were a few, you know, who thought about land redistribution and things like that. And, and uh, uh, But compensation was not something, compensation of the slaves was not, uh, of, the, of the formerly enslaved people was not something that he and most Republicans were thinking about. I would like to push you on this a bit and try to, read the tea leaves so okay um lincoln is killed andrew johnson becomes president oh. andrew johnson shows himself to be a thoroughgoing reactionary he gets the he gets the left wing of the republican party in particular really angry with him right. because of his recalcitrant is it is it arg is it is it is it possible to think that there because might have been. of Andrew Johnson, Reconstruction actually became more radical than it would have been had Lincoln lived? Yes. Yes, I think so. I think so. I think a lot of what are the radical, uh, many of the, not the, not the 13th and 14th Amendments, but I think uh, maybe the 15th Amendment, you know, uh, uh, because it was so deeply tied to the sense that uh, an obstreperous president could undermine reconstruction in the South, that you had to have uh, have black voting rights as a bulwark against such a, a, a dangerous executive authority. And that might not have been the case had Lincoln lived. Is it, is it, is it out of order to think then that maybe it was a good thing that Andrew Johnson became president. <laughs> yes. You think that's way out? <laughs> I don't know, you know, uh, if you love Joe Biden, could you say that it was a good thing that we had Donald Trump as president? Because if we didn't, we wouldn't have had Joe Biden. I, I don't know, I don't know. I, 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 Johnson was so horrible, I, I, I don't. 
yeah it's 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 such a it's a strange question to me <laughs> isn't it the case though that with lincoln and reconstruction lincoln did want to bind up the wounds lincoln did want to reconstitute the union right. isn't it isn't it conceivable that lincoln would have allowed the confederates back in without uh you know without without pushing the i don't i don't know i could conceive of that's conceivable but it's pain enough but it's also conceivable to me that as you know the republicans needed to you know consolidate their power as a party and lincoln was a party guy you know and it's not inconceivable to me that he would have recognized that the future of the republican party would depend on a black voting rights in the south and and a kind of alliance or or coalition of of non-slaveholding whites, or previous, you know, or poor whites and and poor blacks, you know, so that's that's consistent with the way he thought about things and the way Republicans were thinking about things. So it's it's conceivable to me that it could go that way as well. Whether it would result in a Fifteenth Amendment, I don't know, but it's not hard for me to imagine congressional statutes that make it, or or you know, or congressional reconstruction requirements that require black voting without a constitutional amendment in order to consolidate a Republican party uh, in the South. Okay. Professor Oates, I think that me and the audience could go on for hours. Yeah. On the other hand, we can't go right. on for hours. Thank you very much. Well, for, thank you folks. For Thanks for your book, for and thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you. It's Thank pleasure. you so much. It's lovely when history and law dance together. Thank you. They're the same thing. Right? <laughs> Have you. a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye.